extra time. Hello and welcome back to the Extra Time podcast. It's me, Patrick Van Straten, your regular host. And today I'm joined by the Man United side of the office. It's Joe Tomlinson. Hello, Joe. How's it going, boys? And Michael McCubbin. Hello, Michael. How's it going? How are you two doing after what was quite a disappointing evening last night as Man United fans? Uh, yeah, pretty disappointed. Go pretty on, Mike, disappointed. Right, you talk about um, it. <laughs> it. Yeah, it was, it was disappointing rather than kind of anger-inducing, to be honest, which I think is, um, you know, I, d- I don't know. It's, it's a weird one. I think if the, if, you, if the Europa League had meant getting Champions League football next season, I think it would it obviously mm. would have been a far... Um, a far bigger disappointment. I think as it stands, I don't know, it, it would have been great to see Ole Gunnar Solskjaer actually make a final this season after after the kind of failures in the FA Cup and League Cup. Uh, but the actual performance on the night probably warranted a win. I think it was just, uh, like against Copenhagen, I think it was just, players just didn't take their chances. Defence wasn't good enough in the in the uh, important moments. So, I don't know, it's, it's one of those ones. After, after kind of, enduring the kind of stuff under Jose Mourinho in these kind of games. You compare this to the severe game under Jose Mourinho in the Champions League two years ago. It's like I'd, I'd have taken your I, I, w- I would have taken a performance like this in this game if you'd give it to me, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, I, I was also very annoyed at the time, but equally we were just by far the better team just couldn't get the ball in the net it was the same thing like Mike said against Copenhagen and there was some really reactionary comments after the game um, by a lot of people talking about oh you know Anthony Martial is just not clinical enough Greenwood's like not ready and you think two weeks ago everybody was saying you know Martial looks like he could be a world class forward his finishing is out of this world Greenwood's overperforming XG by about 100% um, so, yeah, a few too many reactionary comments for me after that one because I actually thought we played really well. And with the right two or three additions, I'm really, really positive about Man United under Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. Um, so I-, I was annoyed, but not about the performance, more about the result. Yeah, well, fortunately, from Man United point of view, it was not even in the top two most <laughs> embarrassing results of the weekend. Um, obviously, Man City exiting at the hands of Lyon in the Champions League quarterfinal was a pretty a pretty huge shock on Saturday night. But the result coming on Friday was even bigger. And today we are going to talk about Barcelona, the mess and how they get <laughs> out of it. Because, of course, Friday night's quarterfinal was historic. I think we all expected that Bayern were going to roll Barcelona, Barcelona over relatively easily. But I'm not sure we saw anything like this. Leo Messi has been papering over the cracks for Barcelona all season long. But all their faults were laid bare in this 8-2 demolition. And to be honest with you, I think when you look back over the last couple of seasons in the Champions League, it does sort of look like part of a trend. You know, obviously there was that embarrassing exit to Roma a couple of years ago. The turnaround against Liverpool last season. And then this time they named their oldest lineup in Champions League history with an average age of 29 years and 329 days, and they got absolutely creamed. I mean, I've got to say that the first 20 minutes of the game, yes, they were getting outshot. Yes, I thought Bayern looked more dangerous and backed Bayern to get the result overall, but Barcelona, Joe, looked pretty good, I thought, in the first 10 or 15 minutes, in attack, at least. Um, yeah and no. I thought I thought that they were exploiting a lot of Bayern's defensive line issues more than they were really good. But I thought Bayern were maybe 10 yards too high up the pitch and looked a little bit vulnerable on that left-hand side. Um, and mm. there was more balls in behind them that were causing the issues. I don't, don't think they were playing sort of vintage Barcelona football and really, really oh, dominating no. the ball. Um, and from that point in... It was just all by it was like mentally they just totally collapsed after like 15 minutes um they just looked shot to pieces both physically mentally technically tactically they just were a disgrace to the barcelona badge so yeah i think 15 minutes they were they were all right but it was more as much by and working the game out as it was them being good well, also, after 20 minutes, um, the scores were level mm. because they'd managed to force that Alaba own goal after going down so to fluky, Thomas man. Müller's fluky. opening strike. Mm. Yeah, but at the same time, he had to make the intervention, didn't he? Like, it wasn't like it was out, totally out of nothing. They had got in behind a couple of times, like you said. I thought Alfonso Davis, this was an example of 
where his recovery pace and his background as a winger perhaps contribute to him being not perfectly in position yeah, quite yeah. a lot of the time. Um, but after Bayern took the lead again through that even Perisic goal, between then and half time, Barcelona had one shot. So from the time they went down 2-1, mm. they had one shot between then and the interval, whereas Bayern had a further 10. Um, McCubbin, where do you think this game was won and lost? Was there anyone who particularly impressed you? Anyone who particularly disappointed you? I mean, it's hard to pick one player in that Barca side because everyone was just so bad, weren't they? Like, I mean, even Leo Messi was was less, it, well, far less influential than you would have even expected in a, in a terrible Barcelona performance. I mean, even thinking back to that, the Liverpool loss last year, when you look back at that, at least you look back at it and you're like, well, Messi still basically did everything within his power um, and the, the the rest of the team just didn't follow suit. In this game, he was he was pretty awful, to be honest. But I mean, the defending was just... I mean, I mean, the, the, I think that's the worst... I can't think of a worse defensive display from a top club, um, especially in the Champions League. I just can't think of it. And obviously that, that showed with the scoreline because no one has conceded eight goals in a single <laughs> um, knockout game in Champions League history. Um so, I mean, I think the last team I can remember conceding eight in a Champions League game at all was like Besiktas against Liverpool in 2008. But um, I think for I think for Bayern in that first half, Thomas Müller was just immense. Yeah. So, so good. Um, both his goals were excellent. I mean, and I guess, I think the I think his second goal was the one that really, that was the one that really killed the game for me because I think he, mm. you know, he beats Longley at the, at the front post. Longley should not be letting him get there, but equally, um, you know, really, you know, really clever play from him. Um, the ball in is is obviously excellent, but the but you know his run to get there is is fantastic too. So I think I think that's that's definitely the moment where I feel like it was like okay, this is this is Bayern's game. Um, I'm not sure whether that made it three one or four one, but that was I, I think that kind of moment showed just how far ahead Bayern are from Barcelona at this moment in time. Yeah, well, I mean they ended up absolutely miles ahead in this game. Obviously, twenty seven shots to seven they had. Um... I mean, Müller, Müller made five chances in this game. Joshua Kimmich made seven. In fact, Müller, with those goals in this game, became uh, the player with most goals against Barcelona in the Champions League, while Alfonso Davis completed a match-high five dribbles. You know, an interesting thing, when I was looking through the stats, I was trying to find a way to show that Bayern had really just had it all their own way and just, you know, Barcelona had made no attempt to stop them. And I found that Serge Gnabry had 100% pass accuracy in this game. And what? I thought, wow, that is crazy for a forward to have 100% pass accuracy. And then I looked at Barcelona and I thought, oh, well, Suarez also had 92% pass accuracy. So maybe maybe it was just like a bit of a freak thing. But then I realised that that's because nine of the 24 passes that Luis Suarez played in this game were from kickoffs. Uh, <laughs> which, wow. That's which crazy. It's pretty amazing stuff. Yeah, the first time Barca have conceded eight goals since 1946. Joe, yeah. how much do you think it pained them to see Coutinho come off the bench and put in the little cameo that he did? Oh, do you know what? That summarises how badly Barcelona is run, isn't it? How has that mm. been allowed to happen? How have they not put a clause in the contract that says you can't play against us? It, maybe it's just commonplace in England and it's not so commonplace across Europe, but I cannot believe that was allowed to happen. Having said that, let's have it right, it wasn't just Coutinho. Barcelona's three record transfers, Dembele, Griezmann and Coutinho, two of them were on the bench from the kickoff and one of them was playing for Bayern on loan. Um, so <laughs> all of them, all over the pitch, Barca were all over the place. In the boardroom, they're all over the place. I thought Setien got it horribly wrong, setting up so narrow with Vidal playing as like a false nine, left wing attacking. Where the f Vidal playing for most of the game, I haven't got a clue. <laughs> um, and that allowed Kimmich and, and Alfonso Davis to have so much freedom. And like you said, I think, did you say Kimmich created like five chances or something there? It doesn't Kimmich created seven doesn't chances. Doesn't surprise me because he had the freedom of the left-hand side against an aging Jordi Alba. Uh, and then he had Alfonso Davis versus Semedo, which was like watching a year 11 versus a year seven on the, on the AstroTurf <laughs> because Semedo, just what another one of Barcelona's utterly failed transfers. But yeah, uh, I actually thought the game was kind of lost in midfield. Just didn't think... Any of the Barcelona midfielders were particularly good. Frankie de Jong, 
what's happened to the Ajax player. We saw drifting past players for fun and scooping up dead balls and playing scintillating football. Just looks a shadow of himself. Achira Vidal looked past it. Busquets looked past it. And the best Barcelona player in midfield on the pitch was a former one, Thiago, wasn't it? He was just by far the best yeah. player uh, in the midfield for either side. And they let him go for 18 million euros. The club is just disintegrating in front of our eyes. It's so badly run. I completely agree. I mean, it's it's the Frankie de Jong thing in particular. Oh, so just sad. Watching him, watching him kind of pass sideways, and I thought, I don't think this is because he's scared to pass forward or run forward. This is clearly something he's been told to do, and that's that's the difficulty I had though in this game, trying to work out what was a tactical. De- you know, because everyone was saying this is so embarrassing for Setien. You know, I can't believe how bad Barcelona look. This is all on Setien, and I kind of thought. It is to some extent. It is to some extent. Like, I do think that there are tactical issues here. However, McCubbin, do you really think that there's much that Setien could have done to prevent this sort of result? Um, I mean, yes, I think. I, I mean, <laughs> that they, like, I mean, it, it's, so, it's so difficult to... I mean, I don't know. It's, it's difficult because I think it, it's clearly like the players basically lost their heads, didn't they? I think... He, he should have made substitutions earlier. I'm trying to think which substitutions he even made, but there are plenty of ways in which you, in which you can stop a result like that. I think where I do have um, sympathy with Setien is is the idea that he could have prevented Arsenal, not, uh, Arsenal Barcelona um, losing comfortably to Bayern Munich. I mean, I think his yeah. it was pretty... Yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's weird. I, I think one of the main criticisms I've, I've seen of the match is which is valid is is the kind of idea like Setien probably knew he was going to get sacked right so why not why not try something completely mad against Bayern and see if it works you know like and and like you were saying Joe like they were yeah they were set up so narrow and and Setien's kind of experimented with kind of more you know more width during his time at Barcelona and that you know when he was at Betis he you know used wing backs to such good effect and that didn't really work when he came to Barcelona to be fair um, you know, like fear, fear pose kind of decline has has been one of the kind of big surprises, I guess, of his of his tenure. But um, but I think to to expect Setien to have come in uh, in you know in January and I, I mean it's just there's just such a lack of belief there, right? Because like Bartomeu, clearly he wasn't his first choice, but he you know he he settled for him. Setien came in kind of speaking up this big game of kind of replicating Cruyff football and, and everything, but to, to actually expect him to both, you know, make Barcelona challenge properly for titles and also revamp their style of play in six months with no with no financial backing in the market or anything like that, um, and having lost players as well is just, I think it's just a bit of an impossible task. And it's, and it's funny because like I did a scout report a few weeks ago and one of the first things I said was stick with Setien because the... I mean, we'll, we'll get onto it, but the kind of implications of, you know, the presidential elections and everything means that, you know, I don't know, like, I don't, I don't really see who, you know, who, who's better for the job at this moment in time, really. Like, I don't, like, the, the problems are so deep-seated that I think a result like this was inevitably going to come at some point. Like, the, like you were saying, Pat, the, it, it's been such a trend in the Champions League in particular that it's just, yeah, it just embodies... Um, you know everything that's gone wrong at Barcelona in the last two or three years. Um, so yeah, I mean, yeah, there could have been things that he did on the night, but inevitably it was gonna it was gonna end in tears, wasn't it? Yeah, I think so. Though, though, I guess you, I guess you are right in the sense of um, there are ways to 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 lose four nil instead of eight two. You know, like I guess I don't think Sheffield United concede eight to to Bayern mm. Munich necessarily. Um, Definitely not. But yeah, we'll get on to managers briefly. But first, let's have a word from one of our sponsors. If you are a Barcelona fan and you watch this game at the weekend, then you probably are in need of a drink. And in that case, Beer 52 (laughs) might be able to help you out. They're offering eight craft beers sourced and curated from the best breweries on the planet for free. All you need to do is go to www.beer52, that's beer52.com slash extra and cover just £5.95 for the postage. Now... Beer 52 is essentially a craft beer discovery club. They send you a subscription box each month to one of their over 150,000 members. And each month's case have a, has a different theme, normally a country of the world. Um, now, if you don't like dark beer, you can actually select an option on your subscription, which means you will only get light beers. And you also get a copy 
of award-winning craft beer magazine ferment and a tasty snack each week now if you sign up you can of course uh, pause or cancel your account at any time and it's a great way to support the uk craft beer scene at the moment while they continue to struggle with what's looking like being a protracted financial crisis so if you would like to try out eight interesting beers that you probably never tried before then go to beer52.com extra to get your first case of eight beers for just five pounds 95 the cost of shipping let's move on then to the managerial situation <laughs> um yeah the the interesting thing is when i was when i was watching this game i actually didn't see it live i recorded it and then i watched it the next day and i was just thinking like i don't know i i, I found there were pa- there were passages of play that I, I i couldn't really watch it was like when i tried to show my wife the office <laughs> and she was kind of like oh this is too this is too cringy i can't deal with it but i kind of thought as i was watching it you know what there's one good thing that's going to come out of this, which is that Barcelona can't pretend that this is like a bad refereeing decision. They can't pretend that it was just like a poor day at the office. This is going to make them rip things up and start again. And yet, looking at the news on the managerial front today, Joe, it seems like they've done exactly what we expected. Well, yeah, I mean, we're recording this on what Monday at two o'clock and <laughs> it looks like it's going to be Ronald Kerman. Um which just seems like a totally bizarre decision. And it seems like a decision from Bartomeu, at least, that is effectively one of, OK, let's just tide us over until the elections. Um, and I'm sure Bartomeu, he must believe that he's he's not going to win that election. Um, he, I don't think he's I don't, I don't, he's standing. I don't think he's standing. Yeah. Yeah, There's okay. only one candidate. There's only one candidate Font. declared at the moment, so, which is Victor Font. Victor Font. Yeah. So Vic, let's say Victor Font comes in. It's... It, I think the appointment of Ronald Koeman is effectively just resigning himself to defeat at this stage, isn't it? Because he's not going to rip up any trees there and he's not going to cause too much damage to the Bartomeu behind the scenes, I don't think. If he'd have gone with Pochettino, I could imagine Pochettino being very sort of vocal about the problems and how poor Bartomeu is. And the same, obviously, Chavi uh, doesn't really want to work with him. So it's not an overly surprising appointment, in my opinion, but I think it's a crap one. Um I think he's going to probably last 12 months. I think the squad is in an appalling state and behind the scenes, they're all over the place. I mean, when I was doing a little bit of research for this, I thought, let's just have a look at their last few you know, transfer windows to see what support these managers have had from the board and from the numerous different people that have been in charge of transfers at Barcelona over the last few years. And I, I couldn't find a single good summer until I went back to 2014 2014, they bought in Suarez, Ter Stegen, and Rakitic, um, which I think is a really good summer. That's a great summer. Since then, they've spent 800 million euros, okay, on 30 Jesus. plus players. I don't think a single player since 2014 has been a good signing. Not one. Uh, in 16 17, they spent 125 mil on Andre Gomez, Paco Alcacer, Samuel Mtiti, Digne, Silicon, and Denis Suarez. Um, so obviously they're all gone except from TT who his knee is left there. Um, 17, 18, they spent 375 million on Usman Dembele, Philippe Coutinho, Paulinho, Semedo, Mina, Delafeo, and Marlon. Um, again, I think they've all been failures at the club. Coutinho obviously scored against them on the weekend and Usman Dembele just has sadly, he's a very talented player, but sadly hasn't worked out. Next season was 130. That was on, Malcolm, Longley, Arthur, Vidal, Mario, none of them have worked. Next season was t- no. I think I think Longley has, and I think I think the perception at Barcelona is that Longley has. I mean, no, I was I was. I think you're being I know kind you say, to say they've just, worked. I think you're being kind to say he's worked. I think that he's a good defender, and I think um, it, I was reading an article in Sport today. You know, like the Barcelona paper that said uh, the entire squad is up for sale with the exceptions of Ter Stegen, Longley, De Jong and Messi. Um, so I think at least the perception mm. at Barcelona is that is that he is worth keeping. Okay, so I won't say he's been a failure then, but he hasn't been a success either, yeah. I don't think. Ju- you, can, you can say the jury's out. Yeah. I think that's he hasn't, fair. Yeah, it remains to be seen. And the same you could say of Frankie De Jong, I suppose, because he's quite yeah, young. Yeah. But the, the next season, obviously, it was Griezmann, obvious failure. Martin Braithwaite, horrendous. Neto, Firpo, Emerson, Kukurea. So 30 plus players there, 800 million euros spent. I think you could maybe, if we're being kind, say Longley has been a success and Frankie Dion might in the future. 
whatever manager gets this job, whether it's Kerman, uh, which it looks like it's going to be at Pochettino in the future, nothing will change while this board and this recruitment is occurring because it's just a from top to bottom. Ever since Zuba Zaretta left in 2016 as director of football after criticising the board, who's in charge of transfers there? Who is signing the players? Not the manager. There's no way Setien was signing players. And I don't think Valverde was, to be honest with you, before him. No. So, uh, well, is, is, is it Abidal? Because it feels like it's not Abidal anymore after that row with Messi. I, I... Well, and the, the rumour is that Abidal is also going to lose his job along with uh, Setien, though that's not confirmed yet. But I mean... They're, they're welcome to have Raul Sanyehi back. He's looking for a job right now. Um, but I don't know, like, Michael, I'm kind of looking yeah. at, the, at the list of managers, you know, even leaving aside the fact that Kuman is apparently already appointed or going to be appointed. You looked at the kind of four favourites, um, according to the betting market, and they were Kuman, Pochettino, uh, Garcia Pimienta, who is the current Barca B coach, and then Xavi. Um, and I think when you look at those managers, so different. coupled, so different. coupled with yeah, coupled mm. with all the players Joe listed, it just seems like there's no organising principle here, right? Yeah, none at all. Um, and I think that's why um, you know people are just calling for Bartomeu to to resign now. Obviously, with the appointment of Komen, that's not going to happen. Um, clearly, you know he. Um, you know, he made that statement after the game saying there's going to be, you know, big changes and whatever. Uh, both of the, But that statement was immediately called out in the press by both uh, Victor Font and Gian Laporta, who we expect to also um, you contest that presidential election as well. They were absolutely scathing of him. Laporta just said that he needs to resign now. Um, I think Font said they, they just needs to be elections as soon as possible and they have been brought forward to next March. So... Yeah, it's so hard. To, it's so hard to see how any of this will change um, until there's new, um, you know, new actual leadership at the club. But out of those four, to be honest, like I would have gone with Garcia Pimienta. I think um, just because he's a low cost appointment, um, he's been at the club for nearly twenty years. He's 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 coached at every single level of the club aside from aside from the uh, the manager's position. Um, so he's a, he's a very cheap stopgap and he's worked with like a number of the young players who who are like, hoping to break into the team. You know, he worked extensively with Ricky Puch in the in in the B team. Um, he led the under 19s to the um, Euro, um the, the the European no, what was it? The UEFA Youth League, sorry, mm -hmm. in 2018 and they, you know, that was that was a t that was a very young team which beat you know, the youth teams of um, Chelsea and PSG and Man City on the way to that as well. So he does have credentials within the Barcelona hierarchy, or within the kind of Barcelona camp. Um, and judging by the fact that, you know, all of Barca's transfer activity this summer has been, um, you know, on, on very young players, on players 21 and under. Obviously, a lot of those deals were done before the summer. But, you know, Trencao coming in, Pedri coming in, who's only 17. Um, I, I just feel like that would have been the most obvious one and also one that also would probably protect Bartomeu's legacy a little bit as well. Like I just don't see what, what Komen's going to do aside from revert the team back to kind of how they were playing under Valverde. And I get, I guess that will steady the ship somewhat, but it's not, it's not very inspiring and, and it will just leave this whole, you know, it will leave the Bartomeu era as being defined by this eight, two loss. I think like, mm. like which, what Barcelona fan is going to be, in, in any way happy with this appointment, let alone inspired that there's going to be some sort of positive change in the next few months. Like, I think, I, I genuinely just think everyone's just waiting for that, for that election now. Uh, do you know um, what as well? It's, it's, su it's such a poor reaction. It's such a poor reaction. Like, do you know what I think as well is that they're in such deep shit because they've got so many players now that have little to no resale value and they've got no money. They've just... Like, I feel like they've got no money left to, to sign any of these players. I remember Valverde, like, kind of honourably, I suppose, if you're a Barcelona fan, refusing his, like, £3 million payout in the end because Barcelona, you know, need the finances. And, like, I look at that squad that played against Bayern. Who's got resale value outside Frankie de Jong and Ter Stegen? Like, I just don't see it. I really don't see where they make money in, in this market at all post-Covid. Well, we're going to come on to the makeup of the squad a little bit shortly. But before we move away from managers, do you agree with Michael about, about Garcia Pimienta or would you have looked uh, for somebody else? Because I was kind of thinking, 
I know that language is an issue and blah, 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 but like, could they not have looked at a Marco Rosa or even a Nagelsmann or something? Like somebody, somebody a bit more ambitious, somebody who's going to, who's going to set the character of the club themselves rather than kind of like, you know, bow mm. and scrape and say like, oh no, Barcelona is so much bigger than me. I'm just a little manager, you know? Yeah, I know what you mean. Um, I think, to be honest with you, Nagelsmann would have rejected them. Uh, I really do. Yeah, I think right. he, he rejected Real Madrid, didn't he? Was it last year or pre-Zidane anyway? Um, I think Nagelsmann's just got Bayern Munich written all over him. He's a massive Bayern Munich fan, isn't he? So I think he'll probably end up there in a couple of years' time once he's done with, with, with Leipzig if Hansi Flick is... Uh, not no longer still around. Who's done a fantastic job, by the way. Um, yeah, that's the thing. If Hansi Flick wins the wins the Champions League and he'll probably win the league again next year, then yeah. you kind of think, how long is Nagelsmann going to wait for that? Buy yeah, job? but I I think that him and Marco Rosa, both of them, would be smart to reject the move to Barcelona. Now, I think any coach in world football um, should be saying no to Barcelona, and I think Xavi's been really smart distancing himself from the job at the moment because he knows that he probably will get it in the future and now is not the right time and I, I certainly don't think it's the right move for Pochettino I think if Pochettino goes to Barcelona uh, he could re do a real dent to his reputation um, which is still quite high despite that, that sort of last 12 months at Tottenham and um, particularly the last six months um, I still, I just think he could do some irreparable damage by going to Barcelona now and kind of dropping down the league, pissing off Messi if Messi leaves or something like that. Pochettino comes in would just be, could be really bad for his own personal reputation before he moves on. Yeah, I agree with that. Interesting. Well, we, I think we're going to need to spend some time here talking about the makeup of the squad, which <laughs> yeah. might, you know, it. In a strong field is probably the biggest issue. Uh, but before we get on to that, let's just have a word from another sponsor. Um, support for the podcast this week comes from Arden University, one of the UK's pioneers in flexible online learning. Arden University offers a range of accessible vocational degree courses from psychology and law to business, accounting and computing at a more affordable cost than other more traditional providers. Now, obviously, we're seeing a lot of universities this year because of COVID moving towards an online teaching system or a blended system. And that is one of Arden University's specialities. They offer flexible learning where you can learn online or face to face uh, with lectures and classes de uh, delivered by teaching staff at one of their UK study centres. Now, this means that you can fit your studies around your other life commitments, whether those be your job, your family, volunteer work or a hobby um, and because you have this uh, blend of tutor-led classes and the flexibility of online learning you can study from pretty much anywhere um, which is pretty amazing stuff really you then get teaching support throughout your degree from enrollment through to graduation um, there's a student support team to help keep you on track with your learning and coursework and now Arden University students successfully completing an undergraduate program get access to a free postgraduate program. So on successful completion of your bachelor's course, you can simply apply for the Arden master's degree of your choice, either via online or blended learning. And provided you meet the entry standards, you'll then be able to progress with your postgraduate education completely free Crazy. of any additional course tuition fees. Um, so this could be a cost effective way for some of our listeners to further their education at a time when... It is extremely difficult to see a path ahead. So if you are interested, please head to Arden. That's A-R-D-E-N dot A-C dot U-K for more information. That's A-R-D-E-N dot A-C dot U-K. So now we come to the real heart of the matter, I think, which is the situation with the squad. And it could be complicated still further this summer by the revelation that Leo Messi is now agitating for a move out of Barcelona. Now, obviously, his... his contract includes this clause which allows him to leave for free every summer but that has actually expired mm. this year it expires at the end of may and clearly this year the summer never came so he will have to either find a transfer fee or convince barcelona to let him leave um he only has a year left on his contract though and i'm gonna put this out here I think that if somebody offers a decent amount of money, Barcelona should let him go. Oh, Pato. Mm. Pato. Yeah. Yeah. What's a decent amount of money? It's funny. I, don't, it's it's funny. I, was, I was listening. It, 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 would be, it would be a mad move, but like I have, I have genuinely heard from like Barcelona fans who, who think it, 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 it's probably the best move for the club. Like 
in in the long run like if if they can get a fee for him at this point well here's here's my theory it's crazy like it's not it's not it's it's definitely not out of the question here's my theory if he stays but they've got kuman as manager i think he still wants to go next summer and then he goes for free and the financial worries are so bad that i think you might have to consider doing it just from that point of view if messi goes Mm. this summer it's going to give you god knows how much like assuming somebody pays for him it's going to give you what 150 mil or something maybe um but the bigger issue is that with wages and all their bonuses they pay him over a million pounds a week at barcelona and i think that getting that money off the books might be important because because look would i want to see him leave if i were a barcelona fan absolutely not but I don't think they're going to win anything really... Like, maybe they sneak a tie to it if Real Madrid implode. But I don't think they're going to win anything significant in the next three or four years anyway, unless they just find a billion pounds and somehow manage to completely <laughs> rejig the squad in the course of one summer. So with that in mind, I think, why why hold on to this in the hope that they're like, oh, well, where would we be without Messi? I don't think you'll be any closer to the title or maybe you'll be closer to the title with Messi, but I don't think you're actually going to win the title. And there's a part of me that thinks this is going to be a long rebuilding Mm. process. If you are resistant to doing something like this, you might actually extend the rebuilding process by another two or three years. And look at this squad. They need at least one new centre-back to partner Longley. They need new full-backs that they might keep Thierpo, I guess. Midfield is absolutely horrible. Um, Pjanic is arriving that's going to make it older even though he's a good player Frankie de Jong's the only long-term prospect f- there up front Griezmann they're apparently looking to sell already um, Suarez has got offers to leave and even if he doesn't leave he's going to be 34 at the end of next season I mean Ousmane Dembele fantastic but I don't know if he's ever going to be fit again at Barcelona to be honest with you and Ansu Fati is a child like I mean there's so much work to be done here and if they do have no money I'm not sure they can afford to to be sentimental and say like, well, we've just got to keep messy because otherwise we'll be a state. It's like, you are a state. You're already a state. You need to do something. I'm going to have to disagree. The, the pro- I'm going to have to disagree. Yeah. With, with, I know. I can see you shaking with, your head. Uh, with the sale of Messi. Um, I just don't think Barcelona, I think you're right in terms of they might not, he might not push them to the title, but losing 50 goals a season from this team now, it, it, I can get a whole lot worse than where Barcelona are right now. Shit can get a whole lot okay. worse. Yeah, they, okay. They, they, okay. they could drop out the top four. That would be that would be what that would be the the main. And issue, I do I think. think that. Okay. I, and I do think that if you can convince Messi to stay this year, on the basis of a whole new structural change under new um, presidents and new directors of football, when Font comes in, I think you've got to try it. I do. If you sell Messi this yeah. summer. And you lose 50 goals from your attack um, for, let's say, 100 million pounds. I don't see the 100 million pounds being spent well enough under this current regime to warrant it. But let's say, well, yeah, that is the issue. That is the issue. But I mean, like, I guess my concern is that Messi goes for nothing next year. And you haven't had the money to really make investment. And you've pretty much got the majority of the same squad who are a year older, you have even fewer saleable assets and Leo Messi is gone. I mean, look at it this way. Say you could sell Messi and you could turn that money around and immediately buy Jadon Sancho. Does that no. does that help change your no, mind at all? No, because it's Lionel Messi. No. I'd rather have Messi than Sancho for the next five years. But you're not going to have Messi for the next five years. But this is what I'm, this is what I'm saying. Have... You've, got to, you've got to believe if you're Barcelona, you can convince Messi to stay. He's been able to leave no, on a no, free transfer for but, the last four years. Yeah, but even if he stays, like in five years, I don't think Messi's going to be Messi. In five years, Messi's going to be 38. I still believe a He's still going to be good, Messi probably. Be incredible. Yeah, but he's not going to be 50 goals. No, he probably won't Messi be 50 now. goals, but then Sancho's not going to be 50 goals. Or very unlikely. Let's say very unlikely. He's okay. 50 goals. Okay, but where's the biting point then? Because Sancho was involved in what was it like thirty something mm. goal, thirty one mm. league goals this season or something. Messi was involved in forty six. Yeah, but, but, but also. So you, at, what, at what at what age do we think they maybe yeah. cross over? That's the I, question. I, I I just don't think you necessarily just plonk Jaden Sancho in this team and it, and it suddenly gets like 
way better. Like Jaden Sancho is no, is neither great, do I. But he has to, but he has to, he has to join a team which is at least going somewhere. Um, I, I think the thing is with Messi, like although I do, I definitely see the logic um, in in him moving on. Like I mean, especially if he, you know, especially if he continues to kick up a, a fuss about everything. I think I think the problem with with Messi as well is just the, the amount of power he actually has at the club. Like I, I don't think you can necessarily. Um, you know, I think I think he's partly to blame for what's happened at the club over the last few years. To be honest, like he's he's, uh, I don't know. Um, but uh, what was I going to say now? I think I think one thing, I, I I in my mind, I'm assuming that Xavi's going to be the manager next year. To be honest, like I I've kind of accepted that that's going to be the case. Um, at least in a, I don't know. At, at least unless the club really do take an even bigger dip. Um, after you know, in the next twelve months, assuming that uh, that result against Bayern Munich is pretty much rock bottom, I think I think Xavi is manager next year. Um, what is in after Komen? And, and in that uh, case, after Komen. After Komen, yeah, I think I, yeah, I think Komen's in this job one year tops. Like I, I don't I don't even know if he'll last the end till the end of the season, to be honest. So, um, assuming that, I think Messi Messi would sure Messi would surely want to stay. I, I think um, I can't really see him. I, but, I'm, but I mean, yeah. At the same time, you, yeah, you've got to kind of and and also he's where does got to Messi ride go out the next few months as well? Where so does Messi go? So where does he go? I think his options are extremely limited. That are going to pay. Ma- Man much City's money. the only viable one, isn't it? Really. And even yeah. Manchester City. Do I see Man City spending 150 million this summer? I really don't. I think not on one player anyway. I think the finances have genuinely bitten in football really hard this summer. Like United not being able to spend 120 million euros on Sancho is, is largely down to COVID. I get, like, we're eating five million pounds mm. every single time we play Man United at the moment, which is a play at home. Like it's massive yeah. fees. Um, so it's not going to be any different for, for Manchester City who um, are signing much smarter players like Ferran Torres who are going to be cost effective effectively and nobody's going to spend nobody in this market is going to spend 150 million on Lionel Messi it's just not uh, and Barca aren't going to let him go for 150 either I mean, they'd rather Bartomeu would rather swallow his own pride and force him to stay for a year than let him go f- for that much money yeah I think that's the thing though like there's the there's the my issue with Barcelona for a long time has been that people are far too respectful of this like memory of what Barcelona was and this idea of what they think Barcelona should be yeah and I think that what they actually need is somebody who does not respect the club at all in a way who just sees it as like any other club and is prepared to do anything it takes to make it better because I do understand it and like Bartomeu is not going to be not going to want to be the guy who sold Leo Messi no but Here's the thing. If I'm Messi, I look at the rest of my career and I think, is there any chance I win another Champions League with Barcelona? I'm pretty certain there isn't. I, I think the the odds are very slim, unless it's like four years' time when I'm a real bit player. Um, and if I'm Barcelona, I think, are we going to win the Champions League in the next two years, in the next four years, in the next six years? I don't really know. I, I truly don't know. Um, not with not on the assumption that Messi's going to keep getting is going to get marginally worse with every passing season. So I I kind of look at it sometimes and I think, okay, there are multiple there are multiple paths potentially to a Barcelona Champions League winning side, but they're all different lengths. And from my point of view, I often think, why wouldn't you want to pick the one that is the shortest? And I think the shortest one because of their financial situation might be. To let him go, but yeah, finding finding a buyer is going to be okay. Hard. So if you let's say alongside Messi, obviously Messi's not going to be the only player to leave. Um, if let's say if he does leave, hypothetically, who, which players would you sell? Which players would you keep? Because I, as a Manchester United fan, I and I woke up this morning. Do you know what? I actually thought to myself, United should have a stab at Frankie Dion this summer. I actually think Barcelona would accept a reasonable bid, um, just because they're s- so don't. short on money. I, I really do. I don't. I don't like Barcelona. Barcelona are not known for accepting reasonable bids, and he's one of the very, very few players that they've said they want to keep. Like, I mean, I understand what you mean. You, you might as well, you, you might as well have like a, a, a cheeky little. And if I was Chelsea, I'd, I'd, I'd be said. going, "Hey, Ter- Andre Ter Stegen, do you, do you really want to play in this Barcelona team for the next four years, or do you want to?" But that is, I'd be tapping him up. I'd be tapping know, that, him up. 
I really would. That is a signing where Barcelona say no. Like I, to to me, if I were if I were in charge of this squad, I would say we're going to keep all the young players. We're going to keep. I, I wrote this list here where I was like Ter Stegen, Firpo, Longley, De Jong, Ricky Puj, and Ansu Fati, and arguably Usman Dembele, um, are all the guys who are both who are young enough and potentially good enough to keep around. But but do then they want to stay? But do they want to stay? Every- how many of these players yeah, want to tough, stay? Tough sh- They've got contracts, man. Like, you can't... This is why you have contracts, so that when players want to leave, you can say, no, you're stuck with our sh- club. Like, I mean, I, I think that I would try and keep all those guys. And I think also they're probably going to have to lean into Griezmann. I think they're probably going to have to say Griezmann's going to be our starting centre forward, regardless of his problems, because his contract runs forever and no one's going to buy it out. Yeah. Like, no one wants him. I think I think the I think the thing is is replace it. It's not even just about it, it's it's. I mean, kind of the, the the main problem is that they you know they never bothered replacing PK or or even when they brought in Frankie De Jong last year they you know they weren't they weren't tough enough to be like you know what Frankie De Jong's coming in and he's going to play Busquets' role and Busquets is no longer going to be a key player for us like that's 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 where the main problem lies like a lot a lot of those a lot of those players you listed I don't think you know you can you can tell them you, you know that they're going to be playing a, a more central role in in the rejuvenation of Barcelona over the next few years. And I think that's something, you know, they could get behind. Um, and it, and in that sense, it's like, I don't know, like you could you can lay kind of blame at a lot of the kind of dead wood that's at, at Barcelona, but with, with, with a much stronger spine, um, you know, th- those players aren't exposed as much. You know, Nelson Semedo, mm. for example, like I know he was disastrous the other night, but he's not, a, he's not actually a bad right back. Like, like he could function fine in a, in a, you know, in a Barcelona team which just has a a stronger, younger, more mobile kind of a, a spine, like they did, you know, five six years ago. Um, so, I mean, it's it's I guess it's a bit of an impossible impossible task in that, like, there's just not the money there to to be able to fund those players unless you can get like rid of literally like everyone on the books this summer. So obviously, like Rakitic is going to be tough to shift. Vidal, although he was quite useful to Setien probably you know needs to go in the next year probably doesn't he yeah. um i'm trying to think like i mean even you know even pk who like came out Suarez. in the press um and and, and said and said that he's you know said, said that he he'll happily step aside like even someone like him who you know kind of embodies the club so much like he, he can he really be like a starting center back for for more than another year i don't think even you know i think he's probably got to go and yeah like you're saying joe like suarez suarez for sure um and to be fair, like that might, you know, there could, there could be some positives to that. Like one of the reasons why Griezmann was such a poor acquisition was because there's literally nowhere for him to play. Um, so like if there's a bit more of a, a space opens for him in, in, in the attack, like, I don't know, like under, you know, under new management as well, like Kuman might even be able to get like some, some decent football out of him. Um, likewise with Coutinho, I know like he's been linked a lot to, to, to a loan move to Arsenal or to, to other clubs, but I mean, one of the main problems with Barcelona was that there was no, there was no real um, creativity from midfield this season. Obviously, you'd probably expect him to play more on the left, but I mean, like no one's good. No one, you're not going to get a fee for Coutinho uh, necessarily. You're definitely not anywhere near the level that you paid for him. So why not bring him back and make him a more important player in this side as well? Mm. Yeah, I, I don't know, man. I I just think that they'll do like the dumbest possible thing because I mean, even today, like the Barcelona papers are reporting that Bartomeu now wants to try and use Griezmann to get in, in as a partial swap for, for Neymar once again. Oh, and this is what this is this madness. is exactly what happened it's with madness. Griezmann, right? They wanted Griezmann at, at, at age 26, 27, 28, um, and they ended up getting him like now that he's heading into his 30s. And similarly, they wanted Neymar back last summer and the summer before, and now they're hoping they could finally get him when he turns 28, 29 in the middle of next season. It just seems like... I, people always talk about getting players who are like good enough for Barcelona, but I actually think that they're ignoring the value of just like smart, cheaper pickups. You know, like like Reguilon is going out of Real Madrid for like twenty three million this summer. I don't know if you can get him because he is a Real Madrid player, but those sorts of players are like perfectly useful to have around the squad. You know, like Sergio Roberto. Sergio Roberto is obviously an academy guy, but Sergio Roberto has been a completely useful a decent player for them in multiple positions for years they need more of those guys uh but i think that's i think that's where the argument for for just utilizing lamazia more is is 
is is strong as well. Like mm-hmm. if, if if the club if the club's gonna go through three or four years of of, of relative darkness, which is, is overdue to be honest. Let's face it. Like it, you know, we, when you know when we were looking at Barcelona even in 2017 post Neymar, did we think they'd come out of the next three years with two La Liga titles? Probably not. Um, so I, I, I don't know. If you're, if you're going to go through that, you need to you need to kind of do the hard work and uh, and, and accept that that you know there's going to be you know you're going to underachieve, but you you might be able to nurture some really talented players in the meantime. There's I, I know like the the general view is that like the the talent coming out of La Masia now is is not as good as it was in the you know late 90s early 2000s which obviously spawned you know the great Pep Guardiola side but but so that um, is true though Mike, it, they, it? Can't, they can't be that bad they can't be that but, bad but like, when was the Ricky last has already has already proven he's 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 more than capable of playing in that midfield I, th- I think I think that La Masia's fell off a cliff if there's not a product come out the last decent product to come out of La Masia was Thiago and that was he left in 2013. If they've had eight years without a solid academy player coming in and being a regular starting name, something has to change. But no one's had a chance. But but no one's had a chance. But really. is that because like, none of them have been good enough to to replace any of the players well, in there? Well, I, d- I mean, it, t- it took about five years. It took about four or five years for Iniesta to become a regular starter in in, in the Barcelona, you know, in the Barcelona side. And I'm not saying that. Ricky Pooch is, you know, at his level at all, but uh, you, you you can't you, you can't make a real judgment unless you unless they're unless they're playing you regularly. Can't. Like Ansu Fati has broken into the team this season and uh, you know and has, has been pretty incredible to be honest. Like considering his age, but I, I agree. Um, but like equally, you... some of the players that have left this Barcelona academy and like that have been considered the top players within the academy. Um, let's just take I don't know for for example uh, Gerard Delafeu when he was in the academy was being raved about found his level at Watford like yeah. if, if that's the level they're producing or let's say Adama Traore who has actually done pretty well at Wolves um, but that's his level Wolves um, I don't think that that's the players that that are good enough to take Barca back to the top level. I think more needs to come out of La Masia because if if these are the top players and some of the other players that have left the academy in recent years, for instance, let's say Sergio Roberto is an academy boy, Pato said then, mm. he's at best a versatile squad player, at best, for this Barcelona team. But that's fine. If, you, if, you, if your squad give you like the rudiments of like, they give you all your kind of bench players and then you just need to add stars to it, I think that's a pretty good position to be in. Like The, the concern is that they they don't give these guys chances because managers know that the standards the standards the expectations are so high at Barcelona that they just simply don't have time to to blood. These I would youngsters. agree with you, Pat. But I mean, Ansu Fati's got chances this but season. But S- Sergio Roberto's played thirty eight games this season. That's not that's not the numbers of a player who's like a squad player. Like twenty seven starts in not? La Liga. Twenty seven La Liga starts. That's a that's a fully fledged first team player. Yeah, though I think that's also partially because of like where he plays. There, there are particular issues there. Like if you're a forward, for instance, you know you're not going to get that number of starts. But yeah, I know what you mean. I, I guess I think that um, I, I do agree though with, with Michael overall. I, I do think that they need to start having the bravery to do this. They need somebody who's going to come in and say, "Well, they're going to need to get somebody who is completely mm. willing to work with what they have, given that they don't have the money to significantly strengthen." But before we finish up then, I'd just like to say, like, if you could target a couple of players Oof. for Barcelona this summer, who would you be looking at? and w- Or at least which positions? Well, it seems like it's going to be tough Eric one. Garcia next season, doesn't it, in the centre-back role as the, as the PK mm. uh, long-term replacement? I don't think he's... Well, I don't really know, to be honest with you, but I would, I would say in the immediacy, he's probably not ready to fill PK's boots from what I've seen of him at Manchester City, but he might well go on to prove me wrong. Uh, yeah, I suppose Jadon Sancho would be a decent pickup, um, but I think you'd have to probably sell Coutinho for a decent fee, uh, sell Luis Suarez to make room for Antoine Griezmann to play central, maybe he plays on the left... I don't know. I think Sancho's a bit of a problem. And then uh, I just think they need a really, really top quality central midfielder uh, to play alongside Frankie Dion, really. Just was watching that buying game thinking, fucking hell, like Busquets' legs have gone and Vidal's, Vidal was n- not good enough two years ago for this level. So uh, a centre mid and a, and, a, and a forward, I guess, if Eric Garcia is going to be the centre-back option long term. Mm, interesting. Michael? Yeah, I think um, 
yeah, someone who can drive that midfield um, is definitely needed. That midfield is way too old. I think maybe like someone like Husamawa. I don't know what he, you know, what he'd be available for. for probably too much. Um, see, they've been linked with Fabian Ruiz, haven't they? A lot as well. Um, although I don't know whether him and De Jong's games might be a little bit too similar. I'm not so sure. Um, and then it's difficult because up front, it's like yeah, I, I feel like I feel like the most cost-effective thing to do would would probably to be just just bring Coutinho back and, and play him a bit further forward. But in the long run, um, I think I've suggested Marcus Turan before. Obviously, he's quite a versatile forward, can play centre forward if needs be as well. Um, just as a, just at a kind of just because he'll he'll probably cost about half the amount that Lautaro Martinez would cost. Obviously, he's been the kind of main main one to to, to succeed Suarez. But I mean, he's yeah he. He's like Sancho money, isn't he? What do you think like, about that move? Is he, is he the guy to, to be there, like, starting forward? I haven't watched an awful lot of him in the season. I, Inter. I mean, his his numbers are unreal. Like, his numbers are pretty much identical with, with Suarez's in terms of kind of shots, um, expected goals, etc., etc. I think he's underperformed his expected goals a little bit this season. But at the same time, like, <laughs> I just think any any star signing, it's just like, if you bring them in now, they're just not going to be. They're not going to give you the impact that you need. And I think you're, like, just, you you need to bring in one of these players when there's just a the, the club's going in a direction. Like you know, like when they brought Ronaldinho in in two thousand and three. Like Laporta had just come in as um, as president, I think. Yeah, and um, and you know there was there was this kind of new vision for the club. They were kind of trying to rejuvenate the club and and, and kind of just you know make them an enjoyable team to watch again. And that was like such a such a statement i think like making a statement now is just would just not be not be advisable at all i don't think there's just there's just no point to it i think you just have to wait till next summer before making a real like a a, a real inroad in the market in that sense yeah what about you pat who would you pick, who would you pick up pat see i i don't know i i guess i i don't see signing those players as like just trying to make a statement of intent i think like that is how you stay you stay competitive while you deal with the rest of the squad. Like if you have, if you have like two elite attackers in your side, you're going to be up towards the top end of the league. You're going to beat, you know, the majority of, of Spanish teams, um, regardless mm. of what's going on around, around the rest of the side. Um, and so I think like if, if they were to go and get, like, Sancho to me is like the best young forward available like you're not going to get Mbappe's and the second and the second best is Sancho so you try and get Sancho you know you could also look at Havertz as well if he's going for 90 mil like and you can make sales and do it like do I think that this is going to like solve all their problems no but I also think that if Messi starts getting injured as he gets older if Messi decides to leave if at least if you've got Sancho there I think there is a path to this team being amazing again whereas if you don't have a single elite attacker then that's that's a re that becomes a really big job um and so yeah i kind of fear for them in that regard i think i think that with center backs defenders they can probably find bargains here and there i think they can probably find you know a 25 million 30 million defender here and there and just try those out um you know bring, bring them in when they sell someone um but in midfield yeah i would probably go for an hour a fabian ruiz a lorenzo pellegrini uh, an, a tongi and Dombele if he's available for cheap um and then I would go for like a lights out forward to take some of the burden off Messi and to hopefully steer the ship once he's gone. Mikey, as well, I wanted to say, would you, uh, <laughs> this is a bit off Barcelona, but would you take Gerard Piquet yeah. at United if he, if he did leave? Well, back at United. Obviously, just said, didn't he? What, uh, on a free? Yeah, if, he's, if, he's, if he is going to step <laughs> aside, as he just said, as he said, uh, step aside to let other players come through. I mean, he'd, be, he'd actually be a pretty useful squad player, wouldn't he? Like, I mean... Um, I, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I'd, I'd take him on a free. Why not? I, I think I would as well. Like I, he, he, I would he, as well. He, he's, he's. I mean, he, he, he does. He has. He has attributes where like some of our other kind of defenders, other other than Maguire, kind of lack, don't they? At least like in the air, um, and, passing out from the yeah, back. I, I mean, yeah, yeah, that to an extent as yeah, well. Obviously, Although just going off topic yeah. there, but Man United, my bad. <laughs> Sorry, Pat. <laughs> Jesus, Maguire PK centre back pairing. Christ. Like that, as a, as a non-Man United fan, I am not scared of playing you with that centre-back pairing at all. I would just, I very just, slow, I think it, very, it's very, very slow. slow. But 
I don't, I don't know. I would just probably take him just, just to, if he is on a free transfer. I would probably have a nibble at him this summer. Depends how long the contract is. Yeah, it's one, two years. One, Depends two years. The... Well, isn't it nice uh, to feel actually kind of smug about the situation of your club relative to Barcelona for once? Um, what a horrible season they've had. Uh, and I, I don't know. I kind of think it's been deserved, to be honest. Like, I think that this board has been getting away with murder for such a long time that I'm glad that they were finally exposed in this manner. Um, thank you guys very much for being on the podcast today. Uh, Michael, do you have anything to plug? Um, I can't really, not really sure to be honest, but go over to Euro Football Daily. There's lots of good stuff on there. Continental Club from last week, we had that discussion about Juve, didn't we? Scout reports, um, are you know, are pretty good as well. Um, so yeah, go and subscribe to Euro Football Daily if you haven't already. Great, Joe. Uh, yeah, go and watch. We need to talk. Uh, last Friday we was talking about some of the worst rumours I'd heard this week, which did involve a player joining Barcelona in the form of Cristiano Ronaldo. So, um, shout out Guillaume Balaguer for that Jesus one. Jesus Christ. Oh, my good God. Uh, yeah, well, thank you very much for listening slash watching. Uh, make sure to subscribe to Football Daily Podcast on YouTube if you haven't already. And subscribe to the podcast using whichever app you use. Spotify, uh, Overcast, whatever. Um, and we will see you next time. See you later, guys. Bye. Bye.